welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So we're going to be continuing with our Epic History TV series on the Napoleonic Wars. This is shaping up to be one of my uh, favorite reaction series that I've actually done on this channel. I think I'll stick with this one for now. Obviously, I'll be continuing with the Kings and Generals series of Ukraine when, as and when they come out. But I think others I'll put on the back burner for now. So things like the History Marsh ones um, and, you know, um, which is the, I've, I believe that was the one on the um, Second Punic War because those ones just don't seem to be getting that much engagement compared to these ones. So I think I'll, I'll stick with these ones for now because there's, um, there's a strange quirk of the YouTube algorithm where if you make videos that get less engagement, it drags down the engagement of all your other videos too. It makes YouTube less likely to promote your other content too. So, um, Thus far, the Epic History TV ones have had quite a lot of engagement, so I'll stick with those for now. Um, but we'll be continuing with our Napoleonic series. So this is the Battle of Yen Auerstedt. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is one of those ones where I, my brain just seems to forget how to pronounce it all the time. Um, but it's the um, defeat of Prussia, which is an interesting one to get into. Um, but as always, uh, please leave a like and a comment if you enjoy what I do here. Let's get some engagement going, some conversations about history in the comments section. Let's get that going. And if you want to support the channel more, please consider subscribing and also check out Patreon as well. There's a lot of tiers on there, a lot of benefits that you'll get. Um, and also, um, the more support I get through that, the more time I'll be able to dedicate to this channel. So I'll be able to do more videos and things like that because it will become steadily become my job, you know, which would be fantastic. So, um, but let's um, get straight into this. So this is the Battle of Jena Auerstedt uh, in 1806. So let's see what uh, this has to say. An Epic History TV History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1805, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, won a crushing victory against the joint forces of Austria and Russia. Napoleon now dominated Europe, able to hand out spoils as he saw fit. In February 1806, he sent an army led by Marshal Massena to overthrow the King of Naples, who had dared to side with his enemies, and gave his throne to his own brother Joseph instead. Another that kind of mentality, while pretty common for, you know, noble families, royal families, that kind of thing, that sort of nepotism, that nepotism is what helps unravel the French Empire after a while, particularly um, with concern to Spain, because um, that sort of nepotism, particularly in Spain and Portugal, was looked on very, very unfavorably. But we'll get to that, you know, that's a whole other topic on the Peninsula War, as it became known. Um, but that's a whole different story. But, you know, that sort of attitude of nepotism and, you know, the born to rule kind of mentality, that's part of what helps unravel the empire after a while. The brother, Louis, was made King of Holland. His German allies, Bavaria and Württemberg, were elevated to the status of kingdoms. While Napoleon made himself protector of the Confederation of the Rhine, a new alliance of German states that would contribute 60,000 troops to his army. In recognition of the new reality, Emperor Francis of Austria formally dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, founded by Charlemagne a thousand years before, but now without influence or purpose. Austria had been humiliated. France remained at war with Britain, Sweden and Russia. But in the summer of 1806, all eyes were on Prussia. The Prussian king, Frederick William III, regarded Napoleon with deep mistrust and had been about to join the coalition against him when news arrived of its disastrous defeat at Austerlitz. He was heavily influenced by his wife, the celebrated and popular Queen Louise, who detested France and Napoleon. She led the influential war party at the Prussian court. Matters came to a head over Hanover, 
a German state which had belonged to British King George III, been occupied by the French, and given by Napoleon to Prussia as compensation for other territorial changes. Now the Prussians learned that Napoleon had secretly offered to give Hanover back to Britain in exchange for peace. Frederick's advisers now persuaded him that war was the only honourable course. But Prussia then made a basic strategic blunder, sending an ultimatum to Napoleon without consulting its new allies in the Fourth Coalition. Big mistake, you know, and this is something that you see happen routinely, actually. And this is why, even though France is facing off against pretty much all of Europe, France keeps winning, not just in part because of Napoleon's genius and the, you know, the experience and innovative tactics used by his marshals as well, which often goes overlooked. You know, it wasn't just Napoleon. He gave a lot of latitude to his marshals as well. Um, and he wouldn't have gotten where he was without them either. Um, but also, the Allies, you know, even though there's several countries, technically, all fighting France at the same time, they coordinate very badly, because they're kind of going at it from their own individual perspectives too. You know, they've, you know, for example, Prussia enters the war and thinks, well, we've got our own set of goals and our own set of expectations, so we're going to fulfill those. Britain might have other expectations, Sweden will have other expectations and, you know, goals, and some of them might not align that well. Obviously, they've all got one common goal, which is to defeat Napoleon, but... You know, besides that, they've all got their own kind of territorial concerns and political concerns and things like that. So to get them to coordinate is very difficult. And as well, to get them to kind of accept an overall leadership, you know, in, in that sense. Britain kind of was from a, an economic point of view, because it was the economy of the British Empire that kept these coalitions going. But... Aside from that, they were very bad at organising, they were very bad at coordinating, at least until later into the war where they finally started learning. And you know, this is something that you'll see in the First World War as well, you know, the French, the British, the Americans, the, they all had their own independent commands, and they didn't really coordinate until very late into the war, you know, until like late 1917, early 1918, where you had like the supreme allied commander who was commanding all allied forces overall. He didn't have anything like that at this time, so that's in part why France keeps winning. Their forces were too far away to help Prussia, who would now face Napoleon's Grande Armée with just the small state of Saxony for support. In 1806, the Prussian army had a fearsome reputation that dated back 50 years to the reign of Frederick the Great. Napoleon, a student of history, regarded it with respect. But Prussia's army... As he should as well, because there's, there's often this um, very strong misconception that permeates history, um, particularly with reference to something like the Napoleonic Wars even, or the, um, but particularly something like the American Revolution, that the British Army was the best in the world. It really wasn't. It was decades behind the Prussian Army. You know, the Prussian Army's drill, for one thing, was much better. Um, it was more uniform, it was more kind of um, centralised, whereas the British Army was kind of this motley collection of regiments that their effectiveness depended on whether their colonels could be bothered to train them or equip them properly. So regiments varied in quality, whereas the Prussian army, it was much more uniform in that sense. It's drill, like I say, its drill was far better and it actually had um, formal education for its officers and for its generals, which the British army didn't have. And it didn't have until pretty much the 20th century. You know, the British army was very good, don't get me wrong, it was very well trained. You know, it was one of the few armies to train with live ammunition, for example. It was very good, but it was also small. It was riddled with inefficiencies that the Prussian army just didn't have. If you wanted the best army in Europe, you went to the Prussian army at that time. But by this time, it had kind of fallen into decay and decline. And, you know, it would be a stretch to call anything other than the Napoleonic French army the best army in perhaps the world at this time. Um, 
but it was obviously facing off against so many different opponents. You know, it was isolated politically, it was isolated economically and things like that. So there were multiple factors that contributed to its downfall. But, you know, the Prussian army held this kind of vaunted reputation as being this, you know, powerful, overwhelming force. And indeed, the first battle of the first decisive battle of the French Revolution um, was the Prussian army against basically a, an army of French conscripts and the French won. You know, it was a surprising, it was just basically an artillery duel and the Prussians withdrew. Um, but it gave that psychological boost to the revolution because everyone thought, oh God, the Prussians are coming. We are definitely done for now. You know, that was the kind of reputation they held. The army had been allowed to rest on its laurels. Its generals were old. Its staff work hindered by bureaucracy and personal rivalries. Its movements ponderous and predictable. Prussian soldiers, however, could be relied on to fight with pride and determination while Prussian cavalry was regarded as amongst the best in Europe. In October 1806, Napoleon invaded Saxony with an army of 166,000 men and 256 guns. Advancing in three columns, the French crossed the mountain forests of the Thuringerwald, along roads carefully reconnoitred by scouts and spies. <laughs> Sorry, I just noticed something that I had to point out. It's kind of uh, one of those like historical ironies, but you know, you've got areas around here where some of Napoleon's most famous victories have been fought. And just up here, you've got the village of Leipzig, which is, you know, um, where essentially when Napoleon's downfall occurs, the Battle of Leipzig, it was also called the Battle of the Nations because there were so many empires involved in fighting it. Um, and that was the battle that basically broke um, the back of Napoleon's empire. Obviously, you have the Battle of Waterloo later on, which was the definitive finishing him off. But it was it was Leipzig the year before that actually broke the back of his empire. So it's just kind of interesting that you've got these two so close together. And I never knew that was how close they were. Napoleon intended to threaten Leipzig and force a decisive battle with the Prussian army, which he believed was near Gera. The Prussians were, in fact, further west, concentrating near Erfurt, on the west bank of the River Saale. Its commander, the Duke of Brunswick, had hoped to threaten the flank of Napoleon's advance. But wrong-footed by the speed of the French, he now ordered a retreat north to find a new defensive line. On the 10th of October, at Saalfeld, Marshal Land's Five Corps clashed with a Prussian advance guard commanded by Prince Louis Frederick, the king's cousin. The Prussian force was routed, and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. Three days later, Land made contact with a large Prussian force near Jena and sent news to Napoleon. The French Emperor, believing he'd found the main Prussian army, rapidly issued orders for his corps to concentrate for battle at Jena. Bernadotte's one corps and Davout's three corps were to cross the Sala and fall on the Prussian flank from the north. But Napoleon was wrong. Land faced a 35,000-strong Prussian rearguard, commanded by General Hohenlohe. The main Prussian army, 52,000 men under the Duke of Brunswick, was further north, moving straight into the path of Davout's Three Corps. The Battle of Jena began at 6.30 a.m. on the 14th of October, in thick fog. Marshal Land's Five Corps already had a toehold on the plateau west of the town and river. His first task was to drive back the Prussians, and win room for the rest of the French army, arriving by the hour, to deploy. His infantry led the way, 
and fierce fighting broke out for the villages of Kospeda, Krosovitz and Lutzeroda. Meanwhile, Augereau's 7 Corps advanced through a ravine, emerging onto the plateau on Land's left flank, while Sult's 4 Corps climbed steep tracks to form on his right. Napoleon joined Lan in the centre of the battlefield, organising a 25-gun battery to support the attack on Wurzenheiligen. The village was won, but then lost to a determined Prussian counterattack. On the right, around 10am, Sult's infantry secured Klosowitz, but was counterattacked on its right flank near Rudigen. A decisive charge by Sult's light cavalry drove off the Prussians, routing their infantry and capturing two enemy colours. As Six Corps began to arrive on the plateau, its fearless but impetuous commander, Marshal Ney, ignored orders and dived into the fighting around Wurzenheiligen, becoming briefly cut off by a Prussian counterattack and having to be rescued by guard cavalry. As well, for anyone who knows anything about the Battle of Waterloo, that impetuousness does not leave Ney either. He kind of retains that for his whole life. You know, there's um, the famous episode at Waterloo where um, Wellington's army is hidden behind a ridge. So, you know, the, um, the French on the lower ground can't really see what's happening. They don't know where the units are moving to. Ney sees what he thinks is Wellington's army starting to withdraw. It was probably just uh, wounded moving to the rear. He launches massive cavalry attacks on them, thinking that he's pursuing a broken enemy. He's not. He's launched cavalry without ar artillery or infantry support against um, infantry squares, which was a huge, huge mistake. You know, so that impetuousness never quite leaves him. General Hohenlohe was expecting the arrival of 15,000 more troops under General Ruschel at any moment. Until then, he remained largely inactive, shoring up his line and ordering limited counterattacks. But he had run out of time. Napoleon had begun the day with just 25,000 men. By 12.30, a steady stream of reinforcements had brought his strength up to 96,000. As the Emperor rode past the Imperial Guard, one young soldier, eager to be sent into action, called out, Forward! Napoleon stopped and demanded to know who had spoken, then rebuked the soldier as a beardless youth who ought not to offer advice until he too had commanded in 30 battles. <laughs> know your place. <laughs> but the moment had arrived. Although the guard, to its frustration, remained in reserve, the other French corps were ordered forward in a general attack. The Prussian army began to give ground. At first it kept its discipline, but then disintegrated into a general rout. Murat's cavalry were launched in pursuit, riding down and sabering hundreds of fleeing Prussians. General Ruchel's two divisions finally arrived at the worst possible moment. They briefly held up five corps' advance, but were soon outflanked broken up by cannon fire, and charged down by French cuirassiers. Meanwhile, 12 miles to the north, near Auerstadt, Marshal Davout was marching southwest, expecting to fall on the Prussian left wing at Jena. Instead, he encountered the Duke of Brunswick's main Prussian army, heading north to take up new positions. Davout's three corps, 27,000 men and 48 guns, was about to face odds of two to one. Also, people might recognize this name here, Blücher. Um, he was the Prussian commander at the Battle of Waterloo and a uh, good friend of Wellington, actually. Um, 
or at least good colleague, I don't know if they were ever friends or not, but a um, little interesting tidbit about that as well is that um, Wellington couldn't speak German and uh, Blücher couldn't speak English, but they could both speak French, and that's how they actually communicated with each other um, when the Battle of Waterloo ended. While Bernadotte's one corps, which had orders to support Davout, was nowhere to be seen. Davout, nicknamed the Iron Marshal, showed no signs of alarm. He formed his first division into a defensive line centred on the village of Hassenhausen, his infantry forming squares to repel a series of cavalry charges by General Blücher's advance guard. His other two infantry divisions arrived to strengthen the line, standing firm in the face of repeated Prussian attacks. But Prussian movements were slow and poorly coordinated, nor did they use their numerical advantage to try and outflank Davout. At a crucial moment, the Duke of Brunswick was shot through the eyes, a wound that proved fatal. King Frederick William himself took command. Several Prussian units remained uncommitted, but the King, convinced he faced the main French army under Napoleon, dithered. Around 1215, Marshal Davout counterattacked. The Prussian army turned and fled. Davout had won a stunning victory against the odds, but at a heavy price. His corps suffered 25% casualties, one man in four killed or wounded. Which are pretty high casualties. I think the common accepted doctrine is that accept the acceptable casualty ratio is about 20% which is dead and wounded um if casualties go higher than that it's con you know it's considered a particularly bloody battle so while inflicting twice as many losses on the prussians When news reached Napoleon that Marshal Davout had engaged and defeated the main Prussian army, he reacted first with disbelief, then heaped praise upon the Iron Marshal, later awarding him the title Duke of Auerstadt. And this is what I mean as well, what I said earlier, you know, the success of the Napoleonic Empire wasn't Napoleon alone. His marshals were, you know, also extremely talented people, you know, they were very effective commanders. It wasn't just, you know, the, the empire was kind of built around Napoleon as one man, but this, its success went to his marshals just as much as it went to him, because they were also innovative, dynamic thinkers, you know, they took the initiative, and more importantly, um, Napoleon allowed them to take the initiative, which is why the empire was so successful and why it expanded so quickly. Marshal Bernadotte, in contrast, was nearly court-martialed for failing to support Davout. Which I wonder, because, a um, little spoiler, <laughs> I suppose, um, Bernadotte is given the kind of stewardship over Sweden, and he actually kind of becomes the king of, he becomes the king of Sweden. And in fact, today, the Swedish royal family is still descended from him. And um, Sweden, under his rule, turns against Napoleon. You know, he, he leads the Swedish detachment that fights Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig. I, I believe he was there, or at least he was the one that ordered it there. But um, I wondered if that was kind of um, one of those moments that sort of built some resentment in him. You know, um, I don't know for sure, obviously, but just one of those things to think about. Napoleon's army began a masterful pursuit of the beaten Prussians, giving them no time to regather their strength. Two weeks after the twin battles of Jena Auerstadt, Napoleon's troops, led by Davout's heroic Three Corps, entered Berlin. The next day, General Hohenlohe surrendered. At Just a small thing as well, when his troops went into Berlin, and they actually visited the tomb of Frederick the Great, who had led um, the Prussians to stunning success in the Seven Years' War. 
and um, I believe Napoleon said something to his marshals. He said something to the effect of, you know, show this man some respect, you know, show him great respect, because if he was alive today, we would not be here. You know, meaning if he was alive today, he would have beaten us. You know, that's how much respect Napoleon had for this guy. Prince Lau. At Lübeck, General Blücher and 20,000 Prussians were driven out of the city in heavy fighting and forced to surrender. While 25,000 Prussians besieged at Magdeburg surrendered to Marshal Ney. Russia's army had been devastated by a Napoleonic blitzkrieg. In just <laughs> uh, that that has to have been a deliberate choice of words there. Blitz because Prussia, um, a German faction, eventually leads the unification of Germany, becomes the most powerful and influential state in the uh, German Empire. And obviously, while Prussia isn't the state that it was in you know, by the time of the Second World War or anything, you know, Bavaria became much more influential in Nazi Germany than Prussia was. Prussia sort of held that cultural dominance over Germany even then. Um, you know, the, um, the Nazis sort of appropriated a lot of Prussian imperialist imagery, for example, to kind of bolster their position. And obviously the Blitzkrieg became a famous German tactic during the Second World War, so that has to have been a, del a deliberate choice of words there, that it was the um, Prussians that themselves got Blitzkrieged in this sense. Just 33 days, Prussia had lost 20,000 dead, 140,000 prisoners, 800 guns and 250 standards. It was a humiliation that proud Prussians like General Blücher would neither forget nor forgive. Unlike Saxony, King Frederick William refused to make peace with Napoleon. He continued to hold out in East Prussia, trusting in the approaching Russian armies to rescue his kingdom. Despite another glorious victory for Napoleon and the Grande Armée, the war was not won yet. Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay, I think we're at the end of the video now, so uh, we'll be getting into the conclusion of this phase of the Napoleonic Wars, which we will continue next time. So, um, again, another fantastic video. The links to Epic History TV and the original video are in the description, so please definitely go check them out. As I say, they are a fantastic channel, just one that I absolutely love, and I can't wait to keep doing this series. So, um, but in, so please make sure that you're subscribed so um, you won't miss any of those videos coming up. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one.